So we're going to um, continue with a conversation uh, about different microorganisms. Sort of a disclaimer. It doesn't mean that, you know, we talked about protozoa. That's it, normal protozoa for the rest of the semester. No, we're still going to encounter more microorganisms. And we're actually going to have a dedicated set of, you know, microorganisms at the end set of bacteria that we're going to talk about, eukaryotes, viruses, but I try to kind of uh, sprinkle them um, in, in get them into the our fundamentals routine to exemplify certain concepts. So um, the viruses, my favorite microorganisms, they are, in my opinion, uh, extremely exciting because they are acellular which makes them technically not living because one of the cornerstone signs signatures of life is that all living things are made of cells and viruses aren't so um, it may sometimes cause uh, very heated conversations among virologists if somebody uses the expression uh, dead virus because you something that is not living cannot be dead or live vaccine vir, live virus vaccine it cannot be alive because viruses are not living if you want my opinion my personal one i think it's it's unfair that viruses are deprived from you know being called live i think they very much alive and they replicate and they hijack the cells but we'll get to this how many viruses are there? Um, if I will tell you there are 5 million viruses, different virus species, um, you won't be able to check them. Nobody knows really how many virus species are there. Vast majority of them, by vast majority, I'm talking 99% perhaps, are not yet discovered. We know we classified about 10,000 virus species. Um, very few cause human disease. By very few, I mean percentage-wise. Uh, there are about 250, maybe a little bit more, viruses that we know of that actually cause human disease. Okay? Don't memorize the number. I'm just telling you that there are a few. It's not a lot. Okay? Majority of them are absolutely benign. They don't cause any bad stuff. Now... What makes viruses not living, except for not having an actual cellular structure? Turns out they lack two essential functional components of a living cell. They don't have ribosomes, meaning they cannot carry out their own protein synthesis. And they do not have own metabolic systems meaning they cannot produce ATP, okay? So they have to use cellular ribosomes and cellular energy in order to replicate, which makes them not only non-living, but also makes them obligate intracellular parasites. Obligate means they must, intracellular, be inside of the cell. Parasite, meaning that viruses take energy from the cell. They use cellular energy for their growth. Now, you have to appreciate that there are benign viruses that don't do any cellular damage. For instance, every single person in that room is infected with anelloviruses. It's true, every person in the world, in fact, is infected with anelloviruses. They replicate, we don't even know where, They're really small, they don't do anything, as far as we know, okay? So far, we're good? So obligate intracellular parasites. Um, there are two main structural types of viruses. Naked, here's the naked virus. Naked viruses consist of a structure called capsid, shown with this, you know, seed-like particles. And inside of the capsid is the genome. 
capsid of a virus, of any virus, consists of proteins. Okay. Does that make sense? Now, enveloped viruses, here an example of enveloped viruses, HIV, have the capsid. You can see capsid schematically depicted over here. And the envelope. Envelope is this structure on the outside. Now, capsid is entirely proteins. Envelope, though, consists of phospholipids and virus proteins as well. Now, which cellular structure consists of phospholipids? Hmm? Yeah, which cellular, not viral structure, but cellular membrane. membrane, yeah. So what viruses do, they, they can't make their own, they steal phospholipids from the cells. Think about it, I usually use this concept, you know, do you know this advertisements for chocolate covered berries? Like in this videos when strawberry pops through the layer of chocolate and covers itself in chocolate. It's basically what viruses do when the enveloped viruses do when it go through the cell membrane. They go through the membrane and they steal a piece of a membrane to wrap themselves in it. Does that make sense? So virus, this is called envel envelopment. Some viruses steal the cytoplasmic membrane, the cellular membrane. Some viruses like herpes takes the uh, herpes takes the membrane from Golgi apparatus, most likely, still don't really know, but definitely not the outside. So they take those membranes to wrap themselves like a gift wrapping, okay? So that's the difference. Um, naked consists of capsid and genome, and enveloped consists of envelope, capsid, and genome inside, okay? Now, um, what are the possible genomes for viruses? It's pretty interesting, really. Remember we talked about DNA molecules, right? And I mentioned that it's a double helix. Double-stranded DNA is uh, a genome of a human, genome of a fish. What is, the, what is the molecule that represents the genome of a bacteria? If it's a genome of a living organism, it has to be double-stranded DNA, right? All living organisms have double-stranded DNA genomes, no exceptions. Well, viruses aren't living, so they don't have to. Turns out, viruses may have double-stranded DNA genomes, single-stranded DNA genomes, RNA genomes. They can be single or double-stranded. They don't have this, this restriction, okay? Um, viruses were discovered by Russian, well, Let's call him microbiologist, Dmitry Ivanovsky. He was working um, with a the tobacco mosaic virus. He didn't know it was a virus, of course. Um, it was a disease of tobacco plants, very devastating disease. And he was curious how this disease is transmitted, what is the agent. And he totally thought it was a bacteria. So in order to demonstrate it, he collected a bunch of infected tobacco plants, okay, ground them up, uh, filtered all that, you know, slush, getting a fluid, clear fluid, which contained the infectious agent. He already knew it's probably something small. And then he took this liquid and he filtered it through this special, well, filter that contained all the bacteria. So everything that is smaller than bacteria got through, but bacteria ended up on the surface of the filter. Does that make sense? So he thought, you know, I'm going to scrape the surface of the filter, and here we go, we've got an infectious agent. And as a control, he took whatever went through the filter. He thought that the flow-through would be totally sterile. He collects the flow-through, which is supposed to be sterile, sprays it on the tobacco plants, voila, they have a, they infected. So this is why he called that virus that he identified a filtrable agent. 
so it can be filtered through the um, filter. Yeah. Does that make sense? Now, um, it was the virus of plants. Uh, later, foot and mouth, mouth disease virus was discovered as the first virus of animals. It was early 20th century. Banovsky was 1899. Size-wise, viruses range dramatically. The smallest human is hepatitis D, which is 20 nanometers. There are viroids of plants, which are essentially just the fragments of RNA. That's it. They don't even have a capsule. But except for the story. Plant viruses can be even smaller. The largest size-wise human virus that we know of is a, a smallpox. It's about 300 nanometers. You don't have to memorize any numbers. Don't worry about it. Um, so smallpox is at the border where you can see viruses with an electron microscope. No, sorry, with light microscope. There are, I mentioned, viruses that infect amoeba that are so large you can literally see them with a light microscope. But general rule, if you want a good picture of a virus, it has to be an electron microscopy. It has to be very high resolution because they are too small. We're clear? We're good? So that brings us to our first question. No, foot and mouth. It wasn't human, just animals. Foot and mouth disease is disease of cattle. Humans get infected too, but it's like really mild. And cattle, um, it's a big pro it used to be a big problem in Britain. They solved this problem by killing all infected animals. Uh, we're talking millions of cows that were just slaughtered and burned. And in fact, um, my former bosses, like way before, 10 years ago, I worked when I worked in Louisiana, one of them was from Britain, and they went for a vacation there, and they took like a river cruise. They were not allowed to get on on, on the shore because of the foot and mouth disease. Be nobody was allowed to get in the shore because if a person gets there, acquires foot and mouth, goes to another part of England, that's a transmission. They completely isolated a certain part of England to prevent spread to other um, cows, basically. So people were not allowed to move. It's like pretty, pretty badass. Is it the, is it the same? Like, is the hand foot mouth disease the baby thing? No, that's different. I believe they belong to even different, different genera of viruses, I think. Yeah. So um, the first representative of viruses that showing you here is papillomavirus. Everybody knows it. Okay. So it's a small virus that has double-stranded DNA genome. So we can write down double-stranded DNA. No envelope. Yeah, that's papillomavirus. So this virus infects epithelial cells, not just all epithelial cells. It infects basal epithelial cells in the stratified epithelium. Now, it's time to turn on your AP1, AP2 knowledge. Try to recall in which parts of the human body we can find stratified squamous epithelium. Anyone? Vagina. Vagina. Mouth. Mouth. <laughs> Generally, you know, um, intro into the uh, digestive, so mouth. Oropharynx, laryngopharynx, skin, right? It's all stratified anus. It's all stratified squamous epithelium. So it infects basal cells, you know, the only layer that actually replicates. Does that make sense? Now, this virus has DNA genome, and it has to use cellular machinery, cellular enzymes to replicate its DNA. Does that make sense? So virus needs cellular machines to make a copy of the viral DNA. Those same machines that make a copy of the cellular DNA. 
let me ask you this. When does a cell make a copy of its own DNA? During which process? Yes, exactly. So before the mitosis, cell has to copy, before the cell division, cell has to copy its DNA. Does that make sense? Majority of cells in your body do not divide. They're actually quiescent. Does that make sense? Otherwise, you would just grow enormously. Okay? So they don't divide. So when virus gets into those epithelial cells, it forces them to divide. Make sense? It forces them to start growing to use that cellular machinery to replicate its own DNA. That makes sense here. Okay? And when epithelial cells in your skin start to grow, you get warts. If epithelial cells in the reproductive mucosa start to grow, you get genital warts. Warts are absolutely benign. They may be a nuisance, but they're benign. You can remove them. Okay? Now, some viral strains HPV-16 and HPV-18, for some reason, have a potential to cause cancer. One of the hypotheses is that they, so what happens, think about this, when cell divides, with every division, cellular DNA gets copied. Makes sense, right? When it gets copied, there is a chance of a mistake, a mutation. The more cell divides, the more mutations cells can accumulate. Does that make sense? The more mutations, the more chances cells will become cancerous. However, your cells have a mechanism to stop it from happening. Basically, there is a, an internal cellular mechanism. If it detects there is something wrong with DNA, cell dies. Right? Well, HPV-16 and HPV-18 shut down this mechanism. So cell that accumulates the signs of being cancers, it just keeps replicating. And you get cancer. You have to understand, cancer doesn't benefit the virus in any way. Cancer is a byproduct of the virus infection. Does that make sense? Virus can replicate without any cancer. What kinds of cancers? Well, cancers associated with stratified squamous epithelium. Mostly cervix of the uterus, HPV, is a leading cause of cervical cancer in the United States. Uh, penile cancer, much less frequent, and anal cancer. Okay, now that's a short excerpt. Now there are multiple lines of evidence showing that HPV contributes to the vulvular cancer, to the oropharyngeal cancers, so it is really uh, an important contributor to you know, people dying. Fortunately, a vaccine, which is called Gardasil, okay, and clinical data that keep being accumulated show that in, well, they mostly look at women, in women who have been vaccinated with Gardasil, the risk for developing cervical cancer is pretty much close to zero. Okay, they're very well protected, and vaccine is approved for um, now for everybody. Until some point, vaccine was recommended for teenagers who did not have any sexual contacts yet, because the main route of transmission for HPV, for cancer causing HPV, is sexual. Okay. Um, in fact, it's the most common sexually transmitted disease in the United States. Um, so it was recommended for teenagers. And if you ask me, I have two boys, they both vaccinated. Recently, um, FDA approved the use for, of Gardasil for adults as well. Uh, previously, we thought that it's useless because if you had sex, you most likely have HPV whether it's HPV-16 or 18 or any, you know, benign 
strain. Does that make sense? But now more studies show that actually vaccinating adults against HPV reduces the risk for um, developing various kinds of cancers. So I hope to get one pretty soon for myself. You know. And the main side effect, that's my favorite for this vaccine, the pain in the side of injection. Because it's a middle and it hurts. And that's it. No other side effects before the end. Question. Oh, yeah. Last year. I think last year. I've, I've heard the news. FDA said, sure, go ahead. So basically, if it's, as far as I understand, if it's approved by FDA, uh, your insurance company will cover it. Good. Thank you for letting us know. No, seriously. Because among all other vaccines, along with Hep B, it's probably the safest one. There is, I don't know what, probably allergy can happen. Allergic reaction. Nothing else can go wrong. Or somebody stabs you with a needle in the eye, but that's not about vaccine. Any questions? So, you're right, cells divide and accumulate mutations, and they can become cancerous. Normally, cellular, there is a system in the cell that detects this. So basically, it detects that cell is on the, you know, the, the slippery slope towards becoming cancer, and cell dies. It kind of kills itself. These two viruses, HPV-16 and HPV-18, they block this detection mechanism. So cell doesn't kill itself and just keep replicating, eventually becoming a cancer. Make sense? Good. So we're gonna start the conversation about, I call it cultivating microbes and you know detection tools that we're gonna use. We're not gonna use all the tools, but um, there are some methods of microbiology we're going to chat about. So first we're going to talk about microscopy. It's a foundational technique. In fact, uh, in our conversations with the, the health school of, that school of health, like, you know, I'm from math and sciences where health, like nursing, dental hygiene, all that kind of stuff. When we talk to those people and do, we ask them, <clears throat> what do you want students coming out of a class to learn. Along with all the knowledge, I say microscopy and reading and plotting graphs. So you can read data and you can work with a microscope. They will teach you everything else. So we're going to work with microscope quite a lot. Now, microscopy is based on the ability of different materials to refract and reflect light. The main type of lens that is used in microscopy is convex because that's your know, magnifying lens. Concave aren't used very frequently. Um, now, we call uh, light microscopy light because it uses a visible light. It turns out <clears throat> the limitations on the size of something that can be observed with light. Um, these limitations are dictated by the frequency of uh, the wavelength or the length of the wave. That makes sense? The shorter, the shorter the wave, the higher the frequency, the smaller object you can observe. So let's say um, if you want to observe something in the red light, it's got to be bigger than something that you can observe with a blue light. Blue light has a higher frequency. That makes sense? It also shows you that, you know, you cannot go limitless. And you cannot observe smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller objects using microscopy, light microscopy. There is a physical limit, about 0 0.2, 0 0.3 micrometers. If something is smaller than that, you have to use electron microscope or x-ray um, 
diffraction, something like that. Something with, with even smaller frequency. So frequency determines the size. That makes sense. Good. The mi microscopes that we're going to work with, the, the cabinet, not today, but we're going to work with, are called light, not because they're light, they're pretty heavy, uh, compound, because they have multiple lenses, binocular, two eyepieces, and parfocal. <clears throat> no, parfocal means that when you change objective lenses, here, this lens. Microscope, every time you change the lenses, microscope remains in the focus. You bring it to focus, you go to a higher magnification, it's still in focus. Does that make sense? So you don't have to like readjust all the time. Now, how do we calculate magnification? Those are kind of questions that I'm asking on the exam. How do we calculate magnification? We multiply the magnification of the eyepiece by the magnification of the objective lens. Make sense? We always refer to the magnification of a microscope and not the magnification of the objective lens. Because let's say this microscope has 10x eyepiece. Some other may have 20x or 5x. So if I say, you know, I observed this specimen with 40x objective, it doesn't really tell another person what was actual magnification. So if this is 40x and this is 10x, total magnification will be 400. Does that make sense? And we always use like, Magnification of 400x. So other people <coughs> can use this data if they want to get the same picture. We're clear with magnification. Magnification is the ability of a microscope to make the image bigger. It has nothing to do with the sharpness of the image, which we call resolution. Resolution um, is determined by a wavelength. That's why the limit, okay? Make sense? The higher the frequency, the better the resolution. Um, it always, you know, fascinates me when, you know, I watch this crime shows or spy shows, TV shows, when they have a lousiest possible picture of a suspect, like tiny little picture on the screen and they blow it up massively and Voila, you have a perfect, like, a, a yearbook image of a person. It's not possible. If you will try to blow something up on your computer screen to look at the small details, the bigger it is, the lower the resolution. That's the nature. Does that make sense? So that's same story with the microscope. You can go closer and closer and make it larger and larger, but it's not going to improve resolution. It's all about... The wavelength. Good? Got it? Yes. Yes. So the higher frequency right here. Oh, my bad. Thank you. So shorter wavelength means higher frequency. Thank you very much. Shorter wavelength is the higher frequency and higher resolution. Those mistakes are not deliberate. I'm not checking your attention. Yeah. Just screw up some myself. Okay, and the last third parameter is the contrast. Uh, difference in brightness between the object that we're looking at and the background. Now, this is a really important parameter in our observations because we're going to be looking a lot at bacteria, bacterial cells, which, and the cell is 60 to 70 percent of what? What chemical? 60 to 70 percent of any cell is water, right? And when we're going to look at bacteria, they're going to be swimming in water. So, essentially, going to be looking at the sex of water in water. 
It's not going to be great contrast, if you ask me. So anything that can improve the contrast is very welcome. And we're going to talk about methods to increase the contrast between the bacteria and the background. So we've got three main parameters. Um, resolution, magnification, and contrast. I want you to be able to distinguish them. I describe your parameter, tell me what it is. Okay? Now, last thing, sort of a fun stuff before we rip it up. The discovery of microscopes. So that's the first microscope right here, number four. It was developed by Anthony van Leeuwenhoek. Um, you may open a lot of textbooks and they will tell you that Leeuwenhoek was a scientist. No, he wasn't. He was a tradesman. He was a specialist in glass polishing. He was really good at it. And you notice that certain shapes of glass make objects look bigger. And he perfected the method, making this microscope. So that's basically an eyepiece, an objective lens at the same time. That's where you're supposed to look. And this is where the specimen is. Okay. So it doesn't look anything like an actual microscope. But nevertheless, Leeuwenhoek did produce first microscope. Robert Hu, who was British, later made a microscope that looks more like modern ones. Uh, my favorite um, story about Leeuwenhoek, what he looks at first when he develops the microscope. Any ideas? Like the first thing, he's, okay, I've got a microscope, I've got to look at something. So what was the first specimen? Something that belonged ultimately to him. Huh? No, no. Much more, much more exciting, huh? Uh, uh He didn't. Oh, he didn't bleed himself, but you, you dig in the right direction. Something that is much easier to obtain. No, he didn't get to saliva. Feces. 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 He looked at his own feces. And we actually have a picture. Well, not his feces. We have a picture of what he saw because he was, turns out he was pretty good at drawing. So he drew exactly what he saw in his own feces. Looks like he had Giardia infection. His depiction of Giardia protozoa is extremely correct. Looks almost like a photograph. So he wasn't really a scientist, but he was a very, very curious man. Now we're going to wrap it up. Uh, we're going to talk about different parts of the microscope on Thursday. Just kind of reminder and keep chatting. Um.